Hello and welcome, I am Dr. Jack and this is a video I've been wanting to do for quite some time now and the reason is that as a pain physician, whenever I'm in the clinic, I have this conversation with patients about smoking and tobacco abuse and how it affects chronic pain. And typically when I have this conversation with them, I get a response of, oh, I did not know that or I don't, I don't understand why no one's ever told me that before. And so I wanted to put this video out, share it with you guys. And the reason for the thumbnail that, um, that led to this video in regards to you know, hoping that if you have a loved one, then please watch this video, uh, a loved one that smokes, then please watch the video, is that in my clinical experience, most people that are addicted to tobacco or smoke are in need of assistance in regards to really understanding what it does to them. And you know whether it's denial or the true addiction to the tobacco is anyone's guess, but what I find is that they literally need to be told and hopefully educated, and ideally it would come from a loved one or someone that cares about them and we'll kind of start that journey for them to start becoming more educated about what tobacco is doing to them long term as well as short term and what that means for their overall health um, down the road and so join me as we take a deeper dive into the topic of chronic pain and tobacco abuse and what it does to your spine your bones your joints as well as your pain tolerance and I'll talk about sort of my experiences with tobacco abuse in chronic pain patients and so without further ado let's just jump straight into it. Welcome, welcome, welcome if you're new here. If you're not, welcome back. This channel is focused on helping you live a healthier, happier, and wiser life through knowledge. So without further ado, let's start off by jumping into the statistics of tobacco abuse. Okay, so here we are at the CDC website and just looking at some facts about tobacco abuse. And you know, one thing I actually mentioned to my male patients is that smoking actually causes erectile dysfunction and that normally gets their attention, as you can imagine. Next section that I find pretty interesting, and in 2018, more than seven out of every 100 people who tried to quit succeeded. So the success rate is not very high and just kind of points towards the addictive nature of tobacco. And I definitely see this clinically as well as so many people struggle to quit smoking. Uh, as far as the life expectancy and how many years are taken off of a chronic smokers um, life expectancy is anywhere from 10 to 15 years. And they've even broken it down to where each cigarette uh, can decrease someone's life by 11 minutes. Some of you may or may not remember the popular news anchor, Peter Jennings. He died of lung cancer and quoted in saying that the amount of deaths that are attributed to tobacco abuse is the equivalent of a jumbo jet, which carries about 480 people, crashing and killing all on board every four hours. Obviously for the purposes of this talk and me being a pain doctor, I'm focusing on talking about tobacco abuse and chronic pain and what I see clinically, but obviously it causes many other various ailments like cancer, increased risk of rheumatoid arthritis, headaches, fibromyalgia, and the list kind of goes on and on and on. There was a study that looked at smoking and chronic pain and what they found was that uh, smokers at the time of pain consultation reported significantly worse pain intensities, pain interference, pain behaviors, physiologic functioning, fatigue, sleep-related impairments, sleep, uh, sorry, sleep disturbance, anger, emotional support, depression, and anxiety symptoms. There was one study that looked at the results of a survey and they found that amongst this group of people that were smoking, 42% uh, of them experienced medically unexplained chronic pain in the past year. So they went to doctors and doctors couldn't figure out why they were having the pain that they were describing. 35% were endorsing medically unexplained chronic pain in their entire lifetime at some point, and 30% among persons endorsing past year or lifetime chronic neck or back pain. There was one study that was done that mentioned how about 20% of the U.S. population abuses tobacco, but if you look at how many people go to doctors and actually are going to them for 
the chief complaint of uh, some type of pain issue, about 50% of those patients abuse tobacco. There was also a study done in Finland where they follow a group of adolescents starting at the age of 11 until they became an adult. And what they found was that smoking was the single largest risk factor for them to be hospitalized for something like low back pain. And statistically, low back pain is about three times more likely in someone who abuses tobacco versus someone that does not smoke. So in regards to say back pain, smoking has been linked to increased uh, lumbar degenerative disc disease. And what that means is in regards to the spine, lumbar degenerative disc disease is this disc here. And it's in between each vertebral body or the bones on top and bottom. And the disc gets very little blood flow. It actually relies on the blood flow on the periphery, on the outside to basically get its nutrients. And the blood vessels that flow there are already quite small. And so what ends up happening is that these blood vessels, when you smoke, they get what's called vasoconstriction. That means that the blood vessels actually, rather than being say this size, get constricted on average about 25% per cigarette in diameter. And that obviously restricts the amount of blood, oxygen, and nutrients that actually need to get to these areas. And obviously there are also things happening within the blood vessel with things like carboxyhemoglobin and you know all the other things that are inside the cigarette that basically impede the ability of even the blood that gets there to really be as nutritious, if you will, um, for the actual tissue that it's giving blood flow to. And this vasoconstriction that occurs also leads to headaches. And so what happens is that a lot of headaches are due to what's called vasospasms or spasms of the blood vessels inside your brain or inside your head and this has been shown in multiple studies that smokers actually have a much higher incidence of having cluster headaches and various other forms of headaches as well. Moving on with essentially what happens at the joint and the spine level when that blood vessel diameter is decreased as well as the nutrients that are able to get there are affected in a big way. Well, that tissue destruction it leads to ultimately bone loss. Um, it can accelerate osteoporosis leading to things in the spine such as say a compression fracture. That's a situation where these bones here, they lack the nutrients. So what ends up happening is that they actually collapse and cause a fracture. It's a very painful incident. And feel free to check out my previous video that I'll link above and below in the description where I talk about back pain. All of those ailments that I talk about in that video, there is a much higher incidence amongst smokers. And ultimately what all of this ends up causing is that it prematurely ages the body. And not only on the inside, meaning the spine and the joints but also on the outside and this is the reason why people that are longtime habitual smokers their skin actually doesn't look as healthy neither and they appear physically on the outside to be older than their actual stated age but what I am finding in the smoking population is that opiates are even less effective long term for them. And there are many theories about this. There was actually one study that was conducted after people had open um, heart bypass surgery and the needs of opiates for people that smoked was actually found to be 33% higher in regards to the amount of milligrams of narcotics or opiates that they needed. And in regards to this type of therapy, not really helping pe uh, people with chronic pain that are smokers this is also true that I've seen clinically in regards to any type of injections or nerve ablations that I perform for patients to help them with chronic pain. It just doesn't seem to work as well and also implanted devices. And just a quick thing about implanted devices or say someone goes and gets any type of surgery, um, many surgeons are very, very hesitant to perform any type of surgery on smokers. And the reason is because of the fact that kind of going back to what I said earlier about the vasoconstriction, lack of blood flow, lack of nutrients to the tissue, that leads to a higher risk of infection and higher risk of your wound not healing that well as well as if you had hardware put into say you had a hip replacement or you had a back fusion with hardware that hardware is put inside bone that has become sort of prematurely osteoporotic due to smoking and lack of nutrients there is a greater chance of that hardware actually failing in some of my past videos where i talk about cbd and regards to the 
chronic pain syndrome. People with chronic pain present with sort of this myriad of various complaints. Um, you know, their sleep, their mood, they have anxiety, they're depressed, on top of the actual physical pain that they experience. When it comes to actually getting better from chronic pain, it's really important to address all of those issues. And one thing that I've noticed in smokers in regards to sleep is that their sleep is extremely poor has all sorts of implications, not just physically, but psychologically, emotionally as well. And it's sort of understandable too, if you abuse tobacco and you need to think about it as basically sort of a catch 22. So nicotine is a stimulant. And so if you smoke before bed, that's kind of like drinking a cup of coffee before bed. But if you do not smoke before bed, what ends up happening is you wake up in the middle of the night because you crave a cigarette. And so you wake up from the withdrawal. What they found in that when people report, you know, why do they smoke or what effects does smoking do for them? And a lot of people reported that it, it seems to calm them. And they found that that calming effect actually isn't so much the cigarette. I mean, the cigarette causes the calming, but what they're calming is basically withdrawal symptoms from the actual nicotine. When they go through this withdrawal, they get anxious. And so when they smoke another cigarette, that withdrawal subsides and then they're less anxious. And so they are correct in that it helps them to relax, but what they're actually treating is nicotine withdrawal. Another interesting thing that patients find when I tell them, and they seem shocked is telling them that it decreases their pain tolerance. And so what do I mean by that? It was a study where they took essentially a measurable hot stick and it wasn't enough to scald the skin, but enough to conduct heat to the point that it was very uncomfortable. And they would rate their pain score on a scale of one to 10, one being very little pain, 10 being severe pain. And when they touched the area of their arm, on average, they got a score rating of about seven out of 10 on the pain scale. So the same individuals went home, quit smoking for three months, and the people that are actually able to abstain from smoke for three months came back and completed the study. They took the same stick, same temperature, touched it on the same part of the arm, and they rated their pain as about a six out of 10. And the only thing that changed was that they had quit smoking. And I know this is all the time, even when I do um, various procedures or injections for patients that smoke, their pain tolerance is just lower. They react in a much more dramatic fashion um, to even the local anesthetic that's used on the skin compared to someone that does not smoke. And it's very similar actually to someone that has hyperalgesia or has sensitivity to pain who takes um, chronic opiates. And that's a effect basically where actually the more opiates you take, your pain tolerance actually goes down as opposed to actually going up. What I've seen with people that use tobacco is, you know, I'll have a patient and they will chain smoke when they get just a bill in the mail. You know, when I ask the patient, well, why are you financially struggling? Can you not afford to pay the bill or something? And the answer is no, they can afford to pay the bill, but it just stresses them out. And so they feel that they have to smoke. And what I found is that over time, what ends up happening is that whenever you rely on a external substance, especially some type of chemical substance to learn to cope with difficult situations in life, any type of stress, what that ends up doing is it robs you of your own mental ability to cope with that stress. And so you end up depending on this external chemical substance to deal with almost any type of adversity that comes your way in life. And I'll give you the example where there was a young lady, she came to me referred by her primary care doctor and she was only 30, mid thirties, like 35 years old. And she had been smoking since the age of 12. And she came to me with back pain and hip pain and I got x-rays and her back and hips were very degenerative um, for her age. You know, when she asked me why her back and her hips are this way, with, I explained to her that it probably has something to do with the tobacco abuse that she has been doing since the age of 12 of one to two packs a day. When I talked to her about quitting smoking, I just remember her kind of breaking down in tears and just kind of screaming out, not screaming at me, but just this kind of desperation yell where she was saying that, well, if I don't smoke, how do I cope with life? And I think that situation quintessentially defines what I have seen clinically. And it also explains why 
I believe that opiate therapy is not that effective for chronic smokers. They require so much and the reason is that they have lost this internal um, ability to cope with these hardships by themselves and so they want to constantly reach for a chemical substance that's externally being given to them to sort of cope with this hardship. As a So I hope you found this video valuable and if you did, please be sure and share this with someone that you know that smokes and so that they can get educated and you can help them hopefully um, ultimately kick this terribly addictive habit that is affecting their health, their well-being and shortening their life in a very, very big way. As always, please be sure to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when my next videos will come out. And I was going to add to this video also my suggestions and how I talk to patients about quitting smoking, but I, I'm, try, I'm working on trying to reduce how long my videos are. I know they're a little longer than the average video on YouTube, so um, you know I, I decided to make that sort of a separate video, so all the more reason why you should subscribe and hit the notification bell. Anyhow, with that, what I will do is end here with a short clip from Peter Jennings, and I will see you guys next time in my next video. Till then. Take care, stay safe, bye-bye, Pura Vida. I've learned in the last couple of days that I have lung cancer. Yes, I was a smoker until about 20 years ago. I've been reminding my colleagues today who have all been incredibly supportive that almost 10 million Americans are already living with cancer, and I have a lot to learn from them. And I hope it goes without saying that a journalist who doesn't value deeply the audience's loyalty should be in another line of work. To be perfectly honest, I'm a little surprised at the kindness today from so many people that's not intended as false modesty, but even I was taken aback by how far and how fast news travels. Finally, I wonder if other men and women ask their doctors right away, okay, doc, when does the hair go? At any rate, that's it for now in World News Tonight.